Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Ross. So my guest today is Dr. Michael J. Gorman. And this is one of those times when I kind of, I don't know, I'm a little bit of a fanboy here. Um, I've been reading the, the works of Michael J. Gorman for over 15 years. I mean, he's a very well-known, established scholar in the field of um, New Testament and biblical studies. He is the um, Raymond E. Brown Chair in Biblical Studies and Theology, a position he's held since 2012 at St. Mary's um, St. Mary's Seminary and University. He has an uh, MDiv and PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. He's the author of many, many books, including the one we talk about in this podcast, which is called Reading Revelation Responsibly, Uncivil Worship and Witness, Following the Lamb into the New Creation, which is kind of a standard um, work on the book of Revelation. And um, that's what we talk about on this podcast. I'm so excited for this conversation. He's awesome. This dude is just so uh, legit. He's a great scholar. He's a super humble uh, man of God. And I'm excited for you to get, to get to know the one and only Dr. Michael J. Gorman. So excited to finally talk to you. Uh, is it Mike or Michael or Dr. Gorman? What do you prefer? I didn't ask you offline. Mike, Mike is great, Preston. Okay. Okay. Mike. Mike yeah. And, and you're, I mean, you're, you're, Obviously, a very, very accomplished scholar, but you're also a a, a a churchman, a lay level servant of the church. I mean, I know you go to or travel the world and and teach theology in so many different contexts, and and you're you're a, a, a layman in the UMC, is that right? Or that's right, uh, yeah, okay. lay person in the and the United Methodist Church, or as I like to call it these days, just changed two, two letters, the Untied Methodist Church. <laughs> <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> well, there uh, there's so many uh, divisions going oh, on right yeah. now within the Methodist Church over, uh, you know, over sexuality issues yeah. and so forth. So we are yeah. we're untied from one another. We're untied from our roots. We're just untied. Oh, wow. But anyhow, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I I have always been deeply rooted in the church um, on it, within three days, like. Sunday, I will have um, helped my wife with children's church. Um, I would have, I, I, I did then lead an adult Sunday school on the Apostles' Creed. And then yesterday, intended our, I'm, I'm a member of our worship team. So okay. I, I, in, in the space of 28 hours or so, those were the things I did um, Sunday to Monday. Okay. Um, I'll preach once next week, uh, next week, next month, and in okay. June. and. So yeah, I, yeah. Uh, try to be a scholar for the church. We have. I, I feel like I've got a decent number of Methodists, both free and United, um, that listen to the podcast more because that's not my background at all. So people would. Uh, I think sometimes people were shocked. It's like, hey, you have some Methodist list. I'm like, I think I've got quite a decent percentage uh, actually. So that so they'll be excited that I'm having a fellow Methodist on to to, to uh, talk. And great. I've had yeah. I've had others, Craig Keener and. Um, uh -huh. I saw a lot of Asbury people and, um, yeah. okay. So I, your book, okay. I have it right here in front of me, uh, for my YouTube followers. Here's the book, uh, reading revelation responsibly. And I love the sub subtitle is awesome. Uh, uncivil worship and witness following the lamb into the new creation. It is one of, if not my favorite book on the book of revelation, partly because you, partly because I think you interpret the book in ways that are, I find the most exegetically compelling. Um, but you also, the book, I love how you set up, you do a great job on just how to read revelation. Then you walk through the book, you know, chapter by chapter. Um, that's a, <laughs> get a phone call. <laughs> if you need to take that, go ahead. In fact, I, 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 no, I, no, no, I need no. to put mine I, on silence. <laughs> I, I failed to do the obviously important thing. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. I did too. I, my mind was sitting there ready to be wrong. So, um, yeah. So just even the structure of the book, we talk about themes, but my favorite thing, and this is what I really want you to highlight is just the, the, um, how the book of revelation is so profoundly political and contributes to yeah. a Christian, what scholars would call a political theology. So that that's that's where I, I would love for you to kind of show sure. how Revelation does that. But let, let's just start, you know, how, how, let's start from the beginning. How do we approach the book of Revelation for people that uh, maybe have assumptions about what Revelation's about? Maybe they're scared of reading the books. They're like, oh, it's right, all this fun right. time stuff that I don't know how to deal with. So, yeah. Well, I think most people stay, go to one extreme or another. They're either so scared of it that they avoid it completely or they're so 
<clears throat> wrapped up in it and in a particular interpretation of it that they just get myopic and focus focus on that. But um, and and I was one of the ones who was afraid of it before I I think in, in, engaged it in a, in a new and, and more compelling way. But so I think it's really important to keep context in mind when you're reading any biblical book, but especially the book of Revelation. What what kind of literature is this? What would it have said to people in the first century? Not to exclude what it might say for us, and that's very important, but to, to start with the historical context, if you will, and just the social context, the political context. What kind of literature is this? And, and I think most people today would say it's kind of a, like a hybrid dog. Mm -hmm. It's a hybrid. It's It calls itself an apocalypse. Mm -hmm. It calls itself, or the first word of the book is apocalypse, mm -hmm. so it sort of calls itself an apocalypse. It calls itself several times a prophecy, mm -hmm. and at least the way its book ended, the beginning and the end, it, it's in the form of a letter. And then there are messages. I don't think we should call them letters, but there's very letter-like messages in chapters two and three. Those are the parts that everybody runs to. Oh, we can interpret these. We can apply these. It's, it's the rest of the book that people have trouble with. Um, so if you read it, it's that kind of hybrid document. It's first of all an apocalypse. It's it's like other apocalyptic literature of the first century and and the environs on either side of the first century. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a it's a word of prophecy. That is to say, it's like Isaiah or Amos or whatever, speaking words of of judgment and salvation, of challenge and hope. And it's a letter written to specific people that needs to be taken in their in their specific context, plural, seven mm -hmm. churches, certainly representing, I think, the whole church of, of that time period and, and perhaps, in, in, in a sense, church of all time. Um, one of the, my favorite comparisons of the book of Revelation to, to get us out of the very so-called literal, and I'll come back to that in a second, I don't think most people who call themselves literalists, read Revelation very literally. But anyhow, um, a couple of people have suggested, and I agree with this, that it's like reading a series of political cartoons. Huh, yeah. Like you would see, uh, especially back in the day when people read newspapers more, you know, <laughs> on the last page of the front section of the paper, there'd be these great political cartoons. And when I was first teaching basic exegesis skills to people, the first thing I would have them do is to do an exegesis of a political cartoon. It was, it was very enlightening, very fun. But, you know, a, a political cartoon, re Republicans are elephants and Democrats are donkeys and, and it's exaggerated. People's body features are exaggerated. And this is what we see in Revelation. Everything is symbolic, cartoonish, not in a funny sense, but in a very profound uh very profound way. So I think if we read it as a as an apocalypse, as a prophecy in the biblical sense, not just a prediction, mm -hmm. and as a letter to real churches and real people, we'll be at least starting out on the right foot. Okay. Do you have let, let's just I, I don't love all the date and authorship and stuff. Like some people love to write whole books on that, but I think I think it may be good to just maybe give a couple minutes on that. So the, the author identifies himself as John. Most lay people assume that's the apostle John who wrote the book of John and yeah. possibly the three letters. Most scholars do not hold that view. Yes, it's a John. Right. It's a different John. So number one, do you have a strong opinion on authorship? Does it matter? And number two, when do you put the date of Revelation? Most people, again, put it kind of late, like in the 90s AD, but some people put it back in Nero's day because there's some clear yeah. Nero allusions in the book. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. love your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I, I think I would go along without, uh, you know, not without making a big deal out of it. I'd go along with the, the consensus, if you will, on probably not the Apostle John and probably at the end of the at the end of the century in the in the reign of Domitian. Uh, it looks like Domitian's being portrayed as a revival of Nero, in my opinion. Oh, okay. So that's, I think, part of the reason you have the Neuronic uh, implications here and there. And with respect to John, I mean, as you know, if you read the book of Revelations Greek and you read the book, Gospel of John is Greek, you think these are very, very different writers with some overlap in theology. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. it, something as simple as Lamb of God imagery, I think used differently, but mm -hmm. nonetheless there. So I would go for 
90 something, somebody well known in and around Ephesus, but probably not the uh, Apostle John. Okay. Now, if you go to Ephesus today, <clears throat> any tour guide will tell you without even <laughs> without even flinching, this is the burial site. This is the tomb of John the Apostle, who was the beloved disciple who wrote the Gospel of John, the three epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tour guides can be pretty confident on some oh, yeah. archaeological <laughs> stuff. <laughs> That's how they make the big bucks. Um, I don't, I, for me, personally, I don't think the authorship matters a whole lot. I don't know why that would matter. Unless we're – well, I guess it would allow – if it was the Apostle John, we can do a lot more parallel work, you know. Um, maybe that would be a payoff, but at the end of the day, I think we can understand Revelation perfectly fine without the author. The date, I think, matters a little bit more as we're trying to, especially when we get to like Revelation 12, 13, 17, 18, some of these more real, yeah. real aggressive political critiques. I think it can be helpful to unpack some of the background, but um, yeah, okay. That, let's, let's just assume that kind of, yeah. Well, there's certainly, I mean, there's certainly enough, uh, evil associated with both Nero and right. Domitian and lots of other, other emperors that if you want to pinpoint one of them as, or that what they represent as a beast, I don't think too many people are going to argue with you, at least the, the latter part of Nero's reign and most of yeah. Domitian's reign. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before we get into, I really do want to um, love to have you unpack some of the real strong political themes, but um, let, just reading apocalyptic literature in general, um, you kind of hinted at, you know, probably shouldn't be taken very literal. If you're looking at a political cartoon, you don't feel like, you know, the, the, the Trump and Biden, you know, the big heads or whatever. And the, some of the stuff they're right. saying is everything's kind of exaggerated. So um, what are some evidences that we shouldn't be reading? We should be reading uh, the book of revelation more symbolically for lack of better terms. Can you give yeah. us just some quick examples that are kind of like yeah. indisputable? Yeah. I mean, one of the best places is, is to look at uh, revelation chapter 17, where it's one of the few places, or for that matter, in, at the end of chapter 12, there are a couple of places where the book actually says, this is that, or this is this, you know, yeah. the seven, yeah. the seven hills or the seven mountains are the seven Kings and so forth. I mean, so the book of Revelation occasionally shows its hand. Right. And when it shows its hand, it shows that what it's talking about is very symbolic and can therefore be extrapolated to say, OK, if that is symbolic, then we should probably assume that other things are symbolic. Yeah. And and when I when I said a few minutes ago that uh, people who claim to read these chapters literally actually don't. Um, if you go back and read, say, Tim um, Tim LaHaye's work, and it's changed, it, it is it has progressed over the years. He doesn't say the same thing today that he said huh. in some other other times. But if you read that that kind of interpretation, for instance, um, he will say occasionally, "Well, the locusts are not helicopters," and that's exactly what many people want to interpret, especially going back to a late great planet Earth and Hal Lindsey associating the helicopters with 20th century then, now 21st yeah, century, yeah. flying machines. Um, well, even a Tim LaHaye says in, in one of his more recent books, these are not helicopters. These are symbols of something. Wow. So wow. when Tim LaHaye starts saying something symbolic about the book of Revelation, I think people should pay attention. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, when people think Revelation, they think, oh, it's all end times. It's all future stuff. You know, in scholarship, people are ten tend to see a lot more first century yeah. stuff going on with with implications for all kind of future empires or whatever. Um, yeah. Can you, yeah? How much of the book should we read as simply talking about the future, if at all? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I think that the book should be understood as a document that would have been aimed at and would have been understood by the first century churches as relevant for them then. There's always a future dimension to prophecy. There's always a future dimension to apocalyptic. Yeah. But as many people have said about prophecy, it is a word on target. It's a word hmm. from God through the prophet for the people in their time period. So even when there's prediction, Biblical prophecy really is about the moment 
hmm. because we want to we want to see how the moment impacts the future and how the future impacts the moment. Hmm. But the moment is is really what's being addressed. So I would say that in one sense, the book of Revelation is entirely about the first century, but it's also about the fact that um, there has to be a future, there will be, excuse me, there will be, and there has to be a future judgment of quote unquote Babylon. Right. And and that judgment is not happening necessarily right now, mm -hmm. but because it's going to happen in the future, it has an impact on how we live in the moment vis-a-vis -vis Babylon. Hmm. We don't get in bed with Babylon, to use that kind of imagery, for instance, yeah. precisely because Babylon is going to be um, it, it is going to face its end and is going to face divine judgment. And we don't want to be part of that, that judgment. And sometimes the judge, I'm just thinking about Revelation 17 and 18, Revelation 18 in particular and 19, where it's it's not in some future time, Babylon will fall. It's Babylon is fallen, right? It's almost the, the, the judgment is the future judgment is so secure that it's spoken of in the present tense. Is that an accurate way of yeah, yeah, yeah. And we see that sometimes in the in the Old Testament prophets as well, where things are so some scholars have even used the phrase um um uh, uh, now I'm we're, I'm speaking off the cuff here. But anyhow, some some scholars have said in in in, la in language use even things sometimes are so definite that you can use um uh, a past tense as if it's already happened or a present tense as if it's already happened. Fallen is Babylon. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. So the, the word of judgment is so secure, as you said, so strong, so certain that we can we can voice it in the present tense. Mm -hmm. So let you, you so we've used the phrase Babylon a few times. John uses it several times. Who who is Babylon in the book of who, Revelation? Who is Babylon? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, such, it's such well, a pervasive theme, you know. Um it's not the United Nations or the Vatican. Let's let's say what it's not to begin with. <laughs> But I think that's important to say because in the in the last 200 years of interpretation in England and the United States, and therefore because of American and British influence, missionary influence around most of the world, that's often been the kind of Protestant interpretation. It's Rome. So, so Babylon was known to be Rome. First Peter uses Babylon language, other um, second, uh, first century, uh, and then the environs, Jewish documents use Babylon to refer to Rome. So if you think of it as a future prediction, well, what's in Rome? The Vatican, the, the head of the Catholic Church, the Pope. Mm -hmm. So you, you get that kind of uh, connection often made. And I think that's really uh, unfortunate and, and very dangerous. Mm -hmm. But Babylon, I would say in, in the summary, is is Rome, but more than Rome. Okay. Um, so it it is, for the first century churches, especially the evil and the and the misuse of power that is in Rome through the em empire mm -hmm. uh, embodied if you will in the emperor and in the all those who support the emperor but because revelation is a message for all churches in all times it is also babylon is that which resembles what rome was doing any kind of um hyper powerful um, I would say idolatrous entity that calls people to ultimate allegiance to it and uses violence and other forms of evil to get and keep its power. I think then you have Babylon, and that, that's why it makes this book so so timeless and so relevant uh, throughout the centuries. I love so Richard Bauckham has a famous quote, and I have it. I'm not. Just want to make sure I'm not, people don't think I'm doing this from memory. I have notes in front of me. <laughs> he oh, okay. says, uh, any society whom Babylon's cap fits must wear it. Any society which absolutizes its own economic prosperity at the expense of others comes under Babylon's condemnation. So I, I think that very much. Yeah. And, and actually, I mean, I, I've got several quotes from, I mean, both, I mean, you, um, uh, Cynthia Long Westfall, um, Bauckham a few different times and other scholars, they all, all kind of. What you're saying is not, it's very common for people to say, obviously the first readers would have said, obviously we're talking about the Roman Empire here, but it's described in such a way that can apply to other Rome-like, empire-like uh, regimes. 
To, yeah. Let me just get the elf, elf out of the room. Would the United States of America be a kind of Babylon? Is Babylon or is not Babylon? Like how? How? I'm sure you get this question a lot. Like how? Yeah. As we make kind of content, as we're looking at all the politics and revelation, should we have an eye on the United States or? Yeah. So let me back. Let me answer that. But let me backtrack okay. for a moment first, because your readers or your viewers and hearers might be interested in uh, Scott McKnight's new book on oh, the right. book of Revelation, yeah. which is um, called Revelation for the Rest of Us. But in that book, he, uh, I think the subtitle, I don't have it in front of me, but the subtitle is something like um, uh, Discipleship for um, Discipleship for Those Who Don't Want, uh, yeah, Discipleship for Those Who Don't Want to um, Find the subtitle, Preston. <laughs> I'm gonna find it. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, I'll keep talking. So anyhow, in that book, he lists, I think, seven appropriately characteristics of Babylon, and um, they're very similar to the ones that I list in in my own book. What what is it that makes Babylon Babylon? It's 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 the mistreatment of people. It's the um, economic disparity that it creates and the economic oppression that it creates. It's the um, empire uh, goals of of harnessing the goods and the people that actually belong to other lands or other people. So um, all these kinds of things where political, religious, and economic power come together mm. Uh, there, I think you you do have a kind of Babylon. Did you find Scott? Yes, uh, yes, it's a, a prophetic call to follow Jesus as a dissident disciple. Thank I love you. that Dis phrase, dissident disciple. In fact, there was another good book written several years ago on that title. But um, yeah. So Scott and I have, are, are friends, and we've been in communication about the Book of Revelation for years. And I, I'm very happy he wrote his book. It's sort of, a, and, and honestly, it's kind of an updated version of my own book in okay. in terms of its approach and so forth. And he would he would be, I think, the first to say it. Yeah, there's some truth in that. But um, the thing that I think distinguishes my take on Revelation, even from Scott's, is, and this will help, I think, answer the question about the United States. Yes, the United States is the, you know, as people say today, the sole superpower. It's it's hard to compare it even to a China or a Russia. But even if you want to put those th throw those three in. Mm -hmm. They all have, in different ways, imperial ambitions and empire-like realities to them. And that's sometimes hard for Americans to grasp because we're not China or we're not India. I'm sorry, we're not China or we're not Russia. That's true. But uh, what a lot of Americans don't realize, for instance, is that we have, we Americans have military bases in over 100 countries around the world. Yeah. yeah. That's that says something about how the United States understands its role in the world and, and its place in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, the take that I have in my book, and this I think is, is, is very important, I think that the problem with Rome that a lot of people don't see that I emphasize is the merger of religious power and secular power. Mm. So you have those in, in chapter 13, you have those two beasts that are part of the unholy trinity that Satan identified as such in chapter 12. And then the <laughs> beast from the sea and the beast from the land, mm -hmm. first beast probably being the emperor or the empire. And the second beast being the, probably the, the propagandists, the, the, the priests and the, mm -hmm promoters of the um, of the uh, religious priests and, and promoters of the empire and the emperor. So I, I refer to that in the title subtitle of my book and in the book, Civil Religion, the, the marriage, the kind of uh, making the secular into something sacred. Mm -hmm. And I think that that gets at the root of the American experience in a very dangerous way because in the first century it was Rome and its religion and Rome and its political entity power so forth but it was unchristian you know it was it was a secular if you will or a pagan or polytheistic way of doing civil religion but now in our day and for a long time and and 
in other countries as well, but especially in the United States, we have this merger of a kind of very Christianity light with a very deep military, political, economic power mm -hmm. that the, they reinforce each other in, in somewhat dangerous ways. And it doesn't always mean it's the government per se, but people who put Jesus and the cross and Christian faith together with some form of American mm -hmm. uh, exceptionalism or even of anti-American violence like we saw on January 6th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, I, I mean, some people would say that's very pro-American, but it's also anti-American and kind of an ironic <laughs> twist there. Depends on what news outlet you're. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I think January 6th, you know, um, if you look at some of the images from that day of people carrying pictures of Jesus wearing MAGA hats and people carrying crosses or images of crosses, that that merger of uh, American and Christian symbolism in a violent context makes the book of Revelation, to my mind, even more relevant today than when I when I wrote the book 12, yeah, 12 yeah. 14 years ago. I'm hearing, so like, I, cause I'm, I'm always trying to, because I, I refer to, you know, being an exile in Babylon to our experience as Christians in, in, in America. And, and uh -huh. I, I'm constantly trying to, to answer some of the pushbacks and, and there, mm. there's several and some, you know, and, and I, I want to be clear. I, right now, and I've talked to Warren Carter about this. He's done a lot of work in, in, in the similar area mm -hmm. that, um, that um, I don't, I don't want to call, I, I think America, you know, I, I ask Warren, um, is America an empire like Rome? Is it kind of like Rome? Not at all like Rome. And, and he says, it, he, he, he kind of said, I, I, I would say it's kind of like, I, you don't want to map one just perfectly on the other, sure. but the, but the very nature in which revelation presents this concept of Babylon is elastic by design so that you don't have to be exactly like Rome to have imperial characteristics that do make you out to be a Babylon. Um, and so, so here's where I'm going to my question here is, one of the pushbacks I often get is, well, yeah, but Rome, okay, they merged politics and religion, but it was pagan. It was forcing Christians to commit literal idolatry, where America, if anything, is the opposite. It has more of a Christian kind of, you know, influence on the government. And they say that positively. And I kind of step back and say, I think that that's almost worse because now you're, you're dragging the church, which is intrinsically anti-imperial or at least non-imperial not at times anti-imperial mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and and marrying it with the power of the empire and you think this this new empire america is good it's for the good of the world and all this stuff and then i don't know we get so far down these kind of different yeah. <laughs> roads that we're just, we need to back way up and look at some foundational stuff before we even get there but um yeah i'd like to say the 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 so-called christian christianizing of the American empire like mission or goal or just characteristics. I, it seems like the book of revelation would be even more horrified at that. Is, is that yeah, oh, for sure? Because what we get in chapter 13 is, uh, as, as Eugene Peterson says in his wonderful little commentary on book of revelation, reverse thunder, you have basically militarism, and propaganda working together. Yes. And the propaganda is religious in in, in overtone. So, uh, or, well, in substance, I guess. So when you when you Christianize that, now you have political and economic and military power being held up by and and supported by and and promoted by the Christian faith. And this really gets back to what I think is the central claim of the book of Revelation, which is that the power of God is displayed not in imperial power, but in lamb power. Yes. yes. The, the, the crucified lamb who was you know, presented in chapter five as worthy of worship and whose life and especially death and resurrection are the key to divine power. Mm -hmm. that's, that's such a profound challenge to any political system, but yeah. a particularly one that's hyper powerful. I, I want to read that those two verses because I think these, I think you and others say these are 
kind of like the interpretive key to the whole book, or at least it's really fundamental to the shape of the whole book. So Revelation 5, uh, verse 4, John says, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. See, the lo- see. it's an important word. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has, has triumphed or conquered, nikao. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then John says, then I saw a lamb. And I, I'm kind of throwing you a softball here that the kind of hearing and seeing. Then I saw the lamb. Didn't see a lion. Right. I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the, at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Can you can you unpack what's going on here theologically? This this lion lamb kind of relationship here in in yeah. in what is indisputably one of, if not the central theological pieces in the book. Well, it's interesting that some uh, I've heard some so called worship songs, uh, contemporary Christian music, which want to present these as two images of Jesus. And we, in a, in a sense, implying theologically, we need to hold on to both. We've got the, the slaughtered lamb, but he's coming back as the, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. as the forceful lion. No, that's the whole point of this image is that we, when we look for the lion of Judah, the, that is for the Jewish Messiah, the figure that we see, and the, as we're expecting, is in fact the lamb who was slaughtered and is now standing, the resurrected, crucified Jesus. And it's not two different images. It's one image. This is the Messiah that we have received. This is the Messiah that we worship, the slaughtered lamb, not some you know, powerful uh, king who kicked out the Romans or tried to destroy the Romans or whatever. Mm-hmm. But what's also important about that image is then what are the discipleship consequences? What are the ethical consequences of that? If this is, in fact, the centraling, central image of the book of Revelation, Bauckham points out, for instance, that the lamb appears 28 times referencing Jesus in the book of Revelation, mm. set seven times four. It's hard not to conclude that seven for wholeness and four for universality. I think that that's not accidental. Bauckham makes that point himself, something like that. Uh, this is the central image of the book of Revelation. And so if that's the case, what what does it mean to imbibe and to live according to this lamb power as opposed to Babylonian power? So ultimately, there's two very different ideologies and theologies being presented in this book. And Christians need to choose between them and not try to merge them. Mm-hmm. I think that that's. I think it, I think it was Bauckham. A lot of people say this now, but I think Bauckham might be the source where in the Reve- in Revelation we see this juxtaposition of hearing and seeing. Mm-hmm. And he'll hear something, and but then when he sees, he'll see a different image. But like you said, these are not two different, like two sides of the coin. It's the second. It's what he sees is interpreting what he's hearing. So that, well, here I, I uh, here's a quote from Bauckham on this passage. Yeah, uh, by juxtaposing by juxtaposing the two contrasting images, John has forged a new symbol of conquest by sacrificial death. Um, exactly, the, the Messiah has certainly won a victory, but he has done so by sacrifice for the benefit of people from all nations. So that the Lamb power, namely sacrifice, nonviolence, death, um, is the power by which he conquers the beast and is the lion. It's not like yeah, he's also lying over here and uses Rome-like power. And then over here, he also uses lamb-like power. No, lamb-like power is is the lion-like power that conquers the world. Yeah. Is that accurate? To, yeah. yeah, I think that's exactly accurate. And so when you get to chapter 19, when, when Jesus comes and we see uh, blood, yeah. is it is it the blood of, of taking the life of others or is it his own blood? And the, the, the theme, I think, runs through the book is that when we have references to the blood of the lamb— blood associated with the lamb, uh, it's his blood. And so uh, that's why it says um, if you know, the, the discipleship implications are if, if, you, are, um, if you are conquered, you, you go off. You know, you're, 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 your role is to bear witness in the spirit of the lamb. The, the language I like to use with my students is we're called to be faithful witnesses to the faithful witness. Mm. 
And if Jesus is the ultimate faithful witness, and that's how he's identified in the book of Revelation, what does it mean to be faithful to him? And it means, I think, uh, in part, to embody this lamb-like power, this refusal to engage in violence and this refusal to um, to do anything that, that violates the, the life mm-hmm. teachings and, and spirit of Jesus. Yeah. So, uh, and I would say this this is throughout the New Testament. Um, when, we, when we go to, to Paul, for instance, I think, you know, both of us have a lot of interest in the Apostle Paul. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Paul and, and John are pretty close here. P- mm-hmm. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 that Christ crucified is the manifestation of divine wisdom and power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this is this is exactly what the book of Revelation says. It says it in symbols. It says it in pictorial language. It is echoing, I think, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or at least the idea that's, that's present there. Um, yeah. This episode is sponsored by Athletic Greens. Okay, so I've tried all kinds of different nutrition drinks off and on over the last 15 years, and the one that I've found to be the most effective is Athletic Greens, which is now called AG1. Uh, just so you know, I've been taking AG1 for about nine months prior to them sponsoring this podcast. Okay, so I'm not just supporting some random product. I'm promoting AG1 because I've already been a huge fan of it. AG1 is like a nutrition bomb to the body. One scoop of AG1 just saturates your system with a wide variety of nutrients. It's packed with uh, 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. Um, it actually replaces a lot of other, other supplements that you won't need anymore, like taking a multivitamin every single day. And it contains various nutrients that supports your gut health. And I don't know if you've you know, if you know this, but your the, your gut health is like so essential to the overall health of your body. I've experienced a noticeable difference in my energy, my alertness, and just like my overall well-being by taking AG1 at least once a day. Sometimes like when I'm traveling, I'll take it twice a day. And one scoop of AG1 a day, I mean, it's a price of like, it's less than like a cup of coffee a day. So well worth the money. If you're looking for a simpler and cost-effective supplement routine, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So go to athleticgreens.com forward slash T-I-T-R. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash T-I-T-R. Check it out. This episode is sponsored by Biola University. Biola is consistently ranked as one of the nation's leading Christian universities. Biola has over 300 academic programs at both the undergraduate and graduate levels, which are available both in Southern California and online. With leading academic programs like business, film, science, and more, Biola's biblically integrated curriculum helps students grow closer to God and gain a deeper understanding of scripture. In fact, I was just uh, at the Biola campus a few weeks ago. I, I toured the campus and talked with several deans and professors, and every single one I talked to was so passionate about making Christ first in all things. I mean, Biola's quality of academics is well documented. There's no doubt about that. But I was most impressed with how utterly Christ-centered the school is. So at Biola, students become equipped for a thriving life and career. They'll learn how to articulate their Christian beliefs. And most of all, they'll be prepared to serve as God's instrument in their community and around the world. Now, through June 1st, um, 2023, you can use the promo code PRESTON to waive the application fee for any Biola program. Okay, the deadline used to be May 1st. They actually extended it for our audience to June 1st. So get your application in before June 1st. Uh, Put in the code PRESTON and get your application fee waived. Uh, Some restrictions may apply. Just visit www.biola.edu for more information. I want to kind of maybe tease out kind of what kind of broader implications for political theology we can get from the from the book. And in particular, I think one of the most maybe startling and unbelieved claims in Revelation that's so at home in first century Jewish and Christian thought, and yet so contrary to how many modern Christians think, is that the dragon is empowering the beast. This comes from Revelation 13, 4. People worship the dragon, which is clearly Satan, because he had given authority over the beast, uh, which is clearly in the first century mindset, some kind of reference to the Roman Empire. Uh, Again, 
without and some people may try to break it down more specifically it's it's the it's the the militaristic rule it's a political rule it's it's literal rome in you know italy it's it's whatever it's it's some reference to um the the yeah of the empire trying to rule the world and you know they worship the beast and ask who is like the beast who could wage war against it they're enamored with the militarism the military power that rome can demonstrate so th- this idea that Rome as an empire, as Babylon is empowered by the dragon, can we imply theologically that other Babylon-like, empire-like governments are empowered by Satan on some level? Um, Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Um, I think the answer is yes, a short answer, but we have to be very careful here. I I don't think it's right to... Um, attribute um, satanic or demonic power to everything a a government does. Okay. Um, that can get that can get pretty dangerous, and I'll come back to that in a second. Okay. But for instance, if we go the, the, the easy example of this is what do we want to say about Hitler's regime? Right. I mean that that's evil to the core, and many people would say that there's got to be some explanation for that that's more than simply human evil, more than simply every, um, you know, most of the German people get, getting on board in some kind of sociological peer pressure reality. There, there's something more demonic about that spirit, about that reality that, that unfolded. And I think that when an empire is that evil. Mm -hmm. The biblical way of saying and describing that is to say it is satanic, it is demonic. There's something about this that is so fundamentally anti-God and anti-human that there's no other way to explain it. On the other hand, I would say that places that are empire-like but not in the extreme of, say, Nazi Germany, then we could say that there are aspects of that government's activity that wouldn't be wrong to attribute to um, mm. a, a power greater than the, than the actual <laughs> civil authority. So, for instance, um, I'll, be, I'll be, you know, probably get some people who say, I can't agree with you about this, but you remember how horribly children were separated and treated at the border uh, a few years ago, not just under the Trump administration, but apparently also even under the Obama administration. Mm-hmm. This, to separate children and to treat them almost like animals, to cage them, there's something profoundly evil about that. What would convince people that that is an appropriate way to treat human beings? And And the answer to that may be, it's not simply human inventiveness or or human ingenuity or even human necessity. We've, you know, what else are we going to do? There's something profoundly evil about that. And I think Hmm. different Christians are going to identify different things as profoundly evil. And this is why we need each other to, to, to talk through some of these things. Some people would say, you know, for instance, a, a government, um, a government approval to do X is demonic. And mm-hmm. someone would say just the opposite, the government approval. Yeah. You know, if the Supreme Court rules for uh, abortion restrictions, that's demonic. If Supreme Court rules against abortion restrictions, that's <laughs> demonic. So we have, that's why I said we have to be careful about what mm-hmm. we describe um, uh, to satanic activity or to demonic activity. But I I don't think we're off the mark at least to raise those kinds of questions. I yeah I get I guess yeah no that's super helpful and I I I'm glad you you kind of touched on it I I don't I don't want to fall back into kind of the um the demonic influence being all of a sudden partisan again you know yeah because that that's a, that we so easily fall back into that because I because I don't think that would I think that would kind of go against and you don't have partisan stuff in Rome necessarily like you do in America. I don't want to map one on the other, but you, you, right. know, you know, you have people that were for empires and for sure. a Republic and you had, you had internal disputes, whatever. And 
the New Testament seems to be profoundly disinterested in better forms of Babylon versus worse forms of Babylon. There's just kind of Babylon, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, even, even, you know, I guess Hitler is an easy example, but even Rome, you, you look at like Roman Empire and I could, you could easily see how people would get swept up in the propaganda. You know, the Pax Romana, they established peace. They built these roads. They kept thieves at bay. Even Christians can say, look, they outlaw adultery. I mean, they, they, um, you know, um, they, I don't know enough about the Roman court system, or whatever, but like you, you can, if you believe even half of the propaganda that came out from Rome, you could be like, Hey, but okay, we have a lot of power and everything, but we exercise it for good. Yeah. There's that famous quote from a, who's a second century, uh, Rome makes a desert with a sword and calls it peace or something. You right, know? Right, but, right. <laughs> and I, I just wonder if there, if there are, and, and look, I, Mike, I'm, I'm really, I don't want to push. I don't want to map the Roman empire onto America too cleanly, naively. Okay. So I'm not, yeah. I, I don't really want to, I don't want to push for that. I want to be exegetically responsible. I just, I, so I'm not going to, but I just, I, I do see, Again, I think empire like, Babylon like, Rome like, there's overlap, there's differences here. Um, because people always point out, well, we're a democracy, like we're not we're not run by dictators or whatever. I'm like, yeah, again, that would be one difference, you know. Um yeah, there's probably I, a lot I, of differences, I, but there yeah. are differences. I as a, to go back to the point I made earlier, whether we call it civil religion or you know, Christian nationalism or religious nationalism. This is, to me, the be, almost beyond some of the militaristic or economic or other political aspects of uh, the American empire, small e in scare quotes or whatever. This fusion of, and, and therefore the sacralization, the making mm. sake of not only secular things, but very sometimes very um, dangerous things activities and things to 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 give them that kind of religious zeal and uh and support and and even propaganda in the name of jesus in the name of christianity that is so common in this country and then as you may remember in the book i go through three or four pages just listing Mm -hmm. the forms of of civil religion that people just take for granted Everything from pledging allegiance with God's name in it yeah. to uh, uh, in prayers in, in, in time of war for success in battle to um, religious language used to to justify one political thing or another. But but this infusion of Christian or theistic you know, Christian light. I used the language earlier. Christian light theology and language into the political realm is not a good thing. It's a, it's a dangerous thing because now we're beginning to sort of put God's stamp of approval on yeah. whatever particular action policy or general reality that we are, that we yeah, are looking yeah. at. And uh, that's very dangerous. Well, and, 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 and again, again, it's easy to pick out kind of the clear evils, you know, or like, you know, Republicans might say like, well, Obama, you know, had all these drone strikes killing children in the Middle East. I'm like, 100 percent. That was horrible. And the other side of the aisle is going to have its own you know, list of horrible things or even like the, un, you know, you look at some of America's and I, I'm not an expert in this. so I don't want to get beyond my skis, but, you know, dabbled enough to know, man, we've done some really shady stuff in Latin America, especially. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. Installing tyrants because they were pro-America and for profound economic advantage for America at the expense of crippling the economy of some of these countries and stuff. And again, fact check everything. People are like, no, that's not what, okay. Just, um, I, there's enough that even if half of the stuff I read is true, it's like, that feels very Babylon-like, you know, like advancing your own economic interests. Yeah serving your own wealth, funneling stuff. I and mean, this is so almost written right out of Revelation 18. It's like when I read Revelation 18, I'm like, I think there's a lot of similarities here, not with everything America does, maybe not sure. with most of, but there's a, there's some overlap here, you know? Um, is I that- think, yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. I think the problem is for many Americans, there's a default assumption that is something you hinted at earlier. There's a default assumption that a, we're a Christian country 
Mm-hmm. B, we do things for the good of the world, spreading democracy, spreading freedom, yes. uh, that this is very hard, very hard for Americans, and, and including many, and I'd say most American Christians, to to think that it's okay to be critical of your own country, because that's unpatriotic, as if patriotism were some right. um, defining Christian value. And rather than saying um, our ultimate allegiance and our primary focus cannot be any any nation state or any political entity, mm-hmm. and we've got to always have a kind of critical eye uh, mm-hmm. toward toward politics. I remember as a freshman in college, I didn't know anything about politics, I took an international relations course. The first day of the semester, I learned something that I'll never forget, never knew, never forget now. International relations course, first lecture, international relations is all about national self-interest, period. (laughs) And, and And I thought, as a Christian, and the professor happened to be a Christian, as a Christian, I thought, wow, that's not very Christian, is it? <laughs> it's I so blatantly have, not Christian, but it's like I most Christians would they'd hear that like, well, yeah, of course. Like exactly. But at the very heart of the Christian faith is an act of of non-self-interest called the self-giving incarnation and death of Jesus, right? Yeah. So from the get-go, we're looking at uh that's not to say all international relations are bad, but once you understand that uh, there's a fundamental dis- disagreement between the basics of Christian faith and the basics of politics yeah. that you have it got to, to at least say we need to be watchful and careful and even critical. Um, how do you I, respond to I because I get this a lot that when people hear me talk about and I, you know just trying to be really precise with my wording you know just trying to like and I want to come back to Romans 13, submit to every governing authority, uh, First Peter 2. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a, sure. I believe that. I believe seeking to go to the city and all this stuff. And, um, and yet that still has to come from a posture of suspicion, um, even protest. Like our submission is because God is ultimately in charge, because we belong to a different kingdom, because weakness and sacrifice is divine power, that these are the motivations for submission. It's not because we think the state is so good great at the end of the day it's still demonically empowered i mean in the first century you know that's the yeah. framework um oh where's i going with this oh because some of the so in my attempt to try to distance a christian identity from the state people say well no christians need to be in, engaged in society and fight in unjust laws and 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 you know um spread a christian influence in all spheres of life including the political life how, how do you respond to that. Well, yeah. I think there's truth in that. In that, what I often say you know, is, the further up the ladder you go, the more dangerous politics becomes. Okay. So, for instance, uh, trying to be a Christian presence in a local city council versus the state government versus national government, where now the the stakes are much higher because at the national level, we're now we're now talking about. Um, explicitly or implicitly supporting, let's say, um, CIA activity in South America mm-hmm. um, or other kinds of activity that simply by being in that government role, you are participating in. And and there's, you know, we could nuance that in terms of various understandings of, of moral responsibility. But anyhow, we don't have time to do that. But, but my point is... Uh, even if we take, it's just fun. Just yesterday was Romans 13 in my in my Pauline epistles class, so All right. it's fresh yeah. on my mind. Yeah. Even if we read Romans 13 1 to 7, you know, it's funny how people call it Romans 13. It's really just the first half of Romans 13. Second half says a lot about um, about love and uh, the context of Romans 13 1 to 7. I was emphasizing yesterday in class is all of chapters 12 and 13. And the first part of chapter 12, very well-known verses for many people is, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice and wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable or logical or rational service. Um, 
do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the good and perfect will of God, etc. So the fundamental posture of the Christian community is one of nonconformity. Martin Luther King said, we're called to be transformed nonconformists. Love, love that. Love that image in one of his sermons uh, in the Strength to Love book. So anyhow, my point is, if we are called to be nonconformists, and that's the fundamental starting point of chapters 12 and 13, there's no way on God's earth that chapter 13, 1 to 7 can simply mean blind obedience to the state, absolute allegiance to anything it does. It implies, in fact, that there will be times when we can't support government activity. It supplies, it, it reinforces the claim of acts. We must be obedient to God rather than other humans, et cetera. Um, so the, the posture that we are citizens of a different kingdom has to affect the way we do, the way we do politics, uh, the way we're involved in the, in, the, in the political sphere, the way we live our common life has to be as a distinct body and not simply um, buying into the yeah. you know, yeah. culture. That's good. And, and, and so, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, submission, which is clear in scripture, Titus, was it three, one, I think even uses the term obey there, uh, for first Peter two, Romans 13, even having, you know, some exile stuff in the old Testament, but submission and allegiance are two very, very different. Sure. John, John Howard Yoder used to say, yes, we submit and we pay the consequences when necessary. Yes. So yes, to submit yes. is very different from obey. And it's very interesting that in Romans 13, um, the word obey does not appear. And I was <laughs> I was remarking to my students yesterday, the study Bible, many of them were using, had edited in the little caption, obedience to authority. <laughs> I said, oh. well, that's very interesting since the word obedience is not there. Uh, it, is in ti- it is in Titus 3, I think. Uh well, uh, I'm, reading yeah, all, no. I'm reading now the CSB, um, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work. But, um, but the, yeah, no. the other, all the other passages say submit and not, but I, I don't, I, I'm not too concerned about submission and obedience as much as allegiance. Cause you could even obey yes. yeah. the governing authorities, which is a kind of submission, but allegiance I think is too, I mean, this is why, I mean, I know I might lose some listeners right now, but just kind of more of a personal thing, I guess. But, I mean, it's rooted in scripture, but like I, I don't pledge the allegiance because, um, but I, I submit to my government authorities. I, 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 I try to be a really good citizen. I pay my taxes. I, um, give honor where honors do, but allegiance is just way too religious yeah. of a concept. And I just can't to I call it my conscience, or whatever. I just, I don't, I can't imagine John, the author of revelation saying, make sure you give allegiance to the beast. Okay. Yeah, make sure you I, pledge your allegiance. Now, if they ask you to do something sinful, don't do it. But your allegiance is still to the beast. That just sounds. That just feels odd. like I don't see that implied anywhere in the shape of, of Revelation. But yeah, we we we. Uh, I haven't pledged allegiance since I was probably <laughs> junior in high school or something oh, wow. like. Okay. Um, yeah, that we. I completely agree with that. And I think people are sometimes afraid to think through that. Stephen Fowl, the author of a book yeah. called Idolatry. Uh, raises that question in the book. Steve Fowle is a great New Testament scholar here in yeah. Baltimore. And um, Steve t- teaches at a mostly undergraduate institution. And, and when he raises this question in class, it's it's like he's got three heads. Students say, how in the world could it? He wants them just to think about the possibility. Is it possible <laughs> that pledging allegiance could be an act of idolatry? And, you know, th- I, I understand the the reaction of students to that. Yeah. But I think it's something we should take very seriously and think about how, how, um, and of course you've got religious language in the Pledge of Allegiance. And that's, yes. it's not specifically Christian, simply theistic, but that's, that goes yeah. back to my earlier point. When you start bringing religious language into political, now you, now you really up the ante significantly. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I mean, it's not funny. It's actually sad, but, I get most nervous when I don't pledge the allegiance when I'm in Christian environments hmm. or when I know Christians are around me. Wow. I, I've I've been in an environment where I'll hear them and 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 
they'll they'll notice somebody not pledging and they they visit they'll they'll start saying look look at that person look at can you believe they're not and i'm like sitting over here like oh if they look <laughs> at me i mean and i you know it's I, and i'm not a scared kind of person like i'm like I, i'm you know I'm well, a pacifist what am i gonna do i'm just gonna fine beat I me don't, up get I, arrested, I, but. I don't <laughs> I don't, I can't think of any experiences of, of in a Christian setting where that's happened, except at a Lutheran high school graduation of my nephew some years ago, and then at a church we attended for a while many years ago. First Sunday we were there was July Fourth weekend. Yeah, and oh, man. that was part of the worship service, and uh, well, anyhow. But I think um, for me, <laughs> the, the the interesting challenge we we don't stand for the national anthem at uh, baseball games. So um, that's also that's also a weird experience. Hmm. Uh, people look at you, what, what's, what's your problem? You know, how, how un-American are you? And huh. to me, to me, that's too much like uh, hymning or, or singing a praise to uh, the nation state. And I, I just won't do it. Hmm. So, I mean, True confession. Sometimes I just get up and use the restroom before the first pitch, just to avoid the national anthem and avoid having to to be looked at. You know, so I I so that's kind of convicting because I, I I stand. I usually put my hands behind my back and I don't. Um, and that that's I I don't do anything. I don't I don't sing it. I don't whatever. Or even the pledge of allegiance. I'll stand and I'll put my arms behind my back and I don't I don't put my hand over my heart because I feel like that's symbolically. Yeah. What that symbol means is the kind of allegiance. I was like I can't go there and I, I usually recite the Lord's prayer. Um, oh. While people are doing. I'll the remember National that anthem. next time the pledge happens. But you yeah. know, uh, I remember having <laughs> as a as a elementary school kid having a family of of Jehovah's Witnesses hmm. and a couple of them were in my my class and they they did just that during the pledge of allegiance they stood politely didn't put their hand over their heart didn't speak and at the time i thought oh how unsomething that is but but i did respect the fact that they stood um i never understood until i was older what they huh, interesting. What, why they were doing what they did yeah that's interesting um oh so many other questions here. so um <laughs> How would you, un um, oh, actually, I, I do want to ask, so going back to the kind of the critique of Christians, like if you, if you push this vision too hard, you're going to cause Christians to not care about justice around them. And that, that, that'd be the number one critique I get is like, hmm. well, you're, you're, you're a privileged middle-class person. It's easy for you to not care about, um, all the injustices around you. I'm like, well, hold, hold on. I didn't say I didn't care about <laughs> injustice. Yeah. I think what if we embodied the way of the lamb as the church in addressing the injustices and not think that working through Babylonian channels are the best way to do it. And, and but even that, like, yeah. what about the civil rights movement? I'm like, I, I think this, I think that's a great example of addressing injustice, even that are wrapped up in the Babylonian systems because well, a couple things, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Number one, they did through, they, 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 at least MLK's heart behind it was we're going to use Christian means Yep. to address unchristian things. We're going to yes. be nonviolent. We'll, we'll go to prison when we're arrested. We'll submit yep. to the government. Like it was very much a Romans 13, Revelation 13 balance and how they went about it. And as far as I know, it was, it was explicitly like not partisan. They didn't think that, Oh, we're going to work through this side of Babylon because they're the good side. And this side's the bad side. It was like, we're going to do this as a protest movement against Babylon, but we're not going to, we're going to still kind of be distant from the ways of Babylon and how we go about this. And that might be an overly glamorized understanding, but I think that was at least MLK's heart behind it. Is that, is that, is that a legitimate? I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Of course, not everybody agreed with MLK. Sure. And did not, there were people who wanted to act violently and so forth. But if you read, for instance, his, uh, his beautiful letter from a Birmingham jail, oh, which, uh, yeah. if you're, your viewers and listeners haven't ever read that it's online, you could, you can yeah. find, beautiful piece of work about the Christian um, character of, of his witness. And then you also, you know, toward the end, um, he, he protested the Vietnam War and people mm -hmm. said, stay in your lane, you know, don't, don't, don't get out of, of um, your focus on civil rights, you'll lose your audience. And his response was, I see these as two sides of the same issue. You know, this is about um, the, the way that 
um, secular power is being used to harm other people, uh, and and I'm going to protest that because it's it's of a piece. It's a seamless garment, if you will, um, for me. Yeah. So. Wow, yeah, that's good. Well, Mike, I've, I've taken you an hour. I just noticed the time. I feel like it's been like 15 minutes, but this is so, yeah, this is so good. Thank you so much for making time for this. And thank you so much for your ongoing work. I hope you keep writing a, a book a year, really, in, in my <laughs> in my wishes. I know that's probably, probably not realistic. But. Well, thanks, Preston. And, and and same to you. Blessings on all of your uh, fruitful ministries. It's it's great to catch up with you and to be with your, uh, your friends. Awesome. Yeah, God bless, Mike. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.